glorious gamers out there. Welcome to the Players 2 Podcast, the video game podcast for gamers like you, by gamers like you. You can find Players 2 on all the social media, that is Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com, that's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, that really, really, really helps us out. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And while you're over there, if you could leave us a little review as well, again, that just helps us out even more. And seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you so much to anyone that's already done that for us. It genuinely means a huge amount and you are an absolute legend to us. All right, and on with the show. My name is Mark Henderson. With me as always, Mr. Lewis Camley. How's it going, Lewis? Going very well, Mark. Good to see you as ever. How's things? Not bad, not bad. Very busy weekend. Very, very yeah. busy weekend. But at least I had a TV loose, which meant I could <laughs> fill it with Elden Ring. We're going straight into our Elden Ring portion of the podcast, which will be a feature, I suspect, for many, many weeks to come. Lewis, how have you been getting on TV less? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maidenless and TV less. I, I haven't been able to play very much this week because, as you mentioned, shortly after we recorded last week, I had to hand over my precious TV to be fixed, which is now just as of today arrived back with me. So, and it all looks good and shiny and bright again, which is lovely. But yeah, that has meant I've not played very much Elden Ring, just a few hours last week. So I guess, yeah, we should focus really on how much you've been progressing, because I'm still a wee bit further ahead than you, but I, I get the feeling you're galloping up behind me. Well, I don't know. You can let me know. So I have now reached the first boss, and I reckon I'm about 15 hours in, so I have got there a bit quicker than you, I believe, because I think that you were about 30 hours in at this point. You can correct me if I'm wrong. No, there. I wasn't quite 30 at that point, but yeah, yeah. I'm definitely a bit north of 15, I think, but I had gone fanning around in a foreign yeah, place. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah, yeah you did. Okay. <laughs> Honestly, Lewis, I said last time as well, like I was struggling with the combat a little bit and I think you had the same experience, but now I'm 15 hours in, I've got to know the game a bit better. I've found a couple of weapons that I really enjoy, first of which being the Uchigatama or Uchigatana, I think, which is, I think, the starting weapon for the samurai class, the class which I strongly suspected I should actually have went, which is slightly annoying. And secondly, Bloodhound's Fang, which is like a much bigger sword. They're actually totally different ends of the spectrum, but they both do bleeding damage, and I found that that is working significantly better for me right now. So, I don't know, I just feel as though I'm much more confident going into fights and things like that now, do you know what I mean? I can approach an enemy and not feel as though I'm going to take three cheap hits or something like that, you know? I don't know, I just really struggled with a couple of the early weapons that I picked up, including the weapon that you're using, actually, which is the Twin Blades, I believe, which I picked up, like, really, really early and i was using for a bit and i just ah I, I don't know i just didn't really i didn't really like it but anyway we're doing good i've sort of decided on a dex arcana build at least for now which is to sort of emphasize the bleeding which it seems to be working very well although i've told that that might become slightly more problematic as the game goes on but i think that that's also a key thing about the game is that like you sort of should choose a build like if you go into elden ring or any of the from games really and you try and be good at everything or you try and be an everyman, you try to be generally good at everything. It's like, no, that's not the way you go about this. Like, be good at a few things and make your build work for the weapons you want to use and things like that. So I've, I've sort of been doing that just now. But Lewis, I have yet to even flirt with the magic side of the game at all. I've not cast an incantation. I've yeah. done nothing at all to do with magic, which is something I really need to get into as well, because I know that, well, you've been using it quite a lot, haven't you? Yeah, well, it was part of my starter class to have some points already in those kind of intelligence and faith skills. And I just, I basically chose that class because I wanted to see the magic because it was one of the things that felt really different from Bloodborne and, sure. the, and the little bit of Sekiro that I'd played. I, I just wanted to see what that was like. But And I've been using it sort of here and there. That I've encountered a few bosses that have been weak to it or a few enemy types that have been quite weak to it and I've used it then. And it's just been a good projectile, basically. But generally speaking, yeah, I'm wielding a twin blade, dual-handed, which makes it a little bit quicker quicker and I agree like I really struggled early game with finding a weapon that I was happy with and that certainly my starter weapon as the prisoner class was this kind of rapier type thing called the e-stock which I just really it felt quite jabby instead of slashy and that was very <laughs> much not my build with Bloodborne which I was still kind of you know hoping to replicate it sounds to me like the two weapons that you've been talking about is kind of the direction I would like to go in as well so I'm going to go and make sure that I pick those up I've already got the Bloodhound Fang but yeah I, I think that that's the most 
most difficult thing for new players coming into Souls games. The thing about the builds, I think, is quite off-putting because you do feel like you have to almost go and do research before you even start the game well, as I mean, to what direction I did. you should go in. <laughs> I did. Yeah, and a lot of people do, and that's fair enough. And you know, I did to a certain extent with Bloodborne. I really haven't looked into it too much at this point. I'm still making a build, I guess. I'm not trying to even out my points at all and be an everyman, like you say. But I've not really looked into the soft caps and the hard caps and all that yet because I just thought I'll feel this out as I go and I'll upgrade things as I, you know, as I feel like I need to based on the items that I'm finding and, and the, the enemies that I'm encountering. But that's again the thing about these games. You can just take it in any direction. You can play it in sort of multiple different ways. I think the thing about Elden Ring in comparison to some of the other ones is that the open world structure means that you can go off and just earn the runes that you need to kind of change your build a bit. Obviously it gets more and more expensive but it's not impossible to do that. We were talking off here about weapon upgrades though and how kind of uncertain we are about how precious <laughs> those resources are and, and therefore like at what point to stick with a weapon and really try and build it out. I did it quite early with the twin blades but I know that come you know the next 10 hours of the game I might come to regret that if I'm finding that something else is a, is a wee bit better. Yeah you know? no definitely I mean all that facet of the game like I can see being very very intimidating for people and it is an intimidating prospect I have to say but I will say as well that this is the from software game that I have researched the least deliberately so that I could experience the game firsthand more do you know what I mean yeah so obviously when I played Demon Souls it was I don't know how many years it was old at that point but also when I played Bloodborne it was years and years old as well people had written dissertations on them probably by that point do you know what I mean whereas <laughs> Elden Ring's not really like that at this point and the nature of the game makes it freer to just explore around where in Bloodborne it sort of felt as though if you were going the wrong way you were wasting your time sort of thing whereas there is no wrong way to go in Elden Ring which is really nice you know no. but still very much enjoying it as I said I'm right at the first boss now so very much hoping to have conquered that and maybe the next one by the time we speak again but we'll see how that goes we'll see how that goes and how much time I've got this week Liz <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's the key question I would say the point that you're at was one of the bits I've enjoyed the most of my playtime so far as you as you join in to Stormvale Castle basically so yeah I'm really excited to hear how you feel about that because it, it is one of those more designed areas that I was talking about a few weeks ago so looking forward to your texts around that all through the week if you get anything to play. <laughs> you will receive many texts if I get some time lost <laughs> don't worry <laughs> all right Alyssa I think it's time for the news all right, Lewis, news item number one. More acquisitions, Lewis, but this time not by Microsoft or Sony. Embracer Group instead have acquired a large part of Square Enix's Western development arm for $300 million. This includes Crystal Dynamics, IDOS Montreal, Square Enix Montreal, and a whole catalogue of IP, including Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, Thief, and Legacy of Cain. It also includes 50 back catalogues games from Square Enix and could also include Square Enix's Marvel games, specifically Guardians of the Galaxy and Avengers, but that is subject to the license holders agreement, e.g. Disney have to say that it's okay. The deal is expected to close in Q2 this financial year, and when all is said and done, it will include 1,100 employees across those three studios in eight locations around the world. Embracer Group have somehow quite quietly been making quite major moves, Lewis, it seems, quite major moves in the video game space, but also just in the entertainment space in general. So as well as all those studios, they also own THQ Nordic, they own Koch Media, they own Deep Silver, they own Saber Interactive, and they own Gearbox, meaning that Embracer Group have 124 internal development studios, which is obscene. Like, I don't know anyone that has that many. That is ridiculous. They might have the most game development studios in the world under their banner, which is a sort of wild thing to think about. Gearbox was bought last year for $1.4 billion. Saber was bought in 2020 for $525 million. They also bought Dark Horse Media, which, like, Dark Horse Comics are, like, a big deal in America. They have also bought French board game company Asmodee for 2.75 billion euros in December 21. So they are not shy about spending cash loose. Basically, on this podcast, we have never hardly mentioned Embracer Group whatsoever, unless it was just in passing through one of these acquisitions. Maybe it was a shout-out, do you know what I mean? But they seem to have quite quietly become a major publisher in the video game space, question mark? 
despite having not really published or made any significant games, certainly none that I'm aware of yet. We'll come on to the Square Enix side of this in a minute. We're kind of splitting this story into two news items, to be honest with you. So this is part one, focusing on Embracer Group, and we'll come to part two in a second when we focus on Square Enix. But I think it is safe to say that Square Enix's attempt to break into the Western market with Western-style games was hit and miss at best, let's be honest. And I think that there have been a lot more misses recently than hits. Do you think this might actually be good for these studios? And again, what do you just make of Embracer Group and all these acquisitions? Yeah, well, starting off with Embracer Group, what what a massive surprise story this was after all the rumblings for weeks about Ubisoft and about whether or not Sony and Microsoft were going to make more acquisitions. Suddenly, half of Square Enix has been hived off and sold to this kind of increasingly monolithic company. I'm sort of reluctant to say the word publisher there. I held back from it because it's not very clear exactly to me at least exactly kind of what the structure is here no i have to say Lewis, like you brought this up just before we started recording like i had written the notes and had written publisher and in actual fact the more we just spoke about it and looked into it it's not clear if they're a publisher at all or what they are really to be honest <laughs> yeah from what i can discern they basically own a bunch of publishers that then have development teams under them you know so th- this all grew out of thq nordic really i think they changed their name from thq nordic to the embracer group to, to did, make themselves did. distinct from the development team THQ Nordic or the publisher THQ Nordic but then yeah they own Gearbox they own Deep Silver they own Saber Interactive I think you're right to say that we've not spoken about them a great deal and I think that's partly because a lot of those teams and studios other than Gearbox aren't massive really and you know not to say that there's not good and big games within all of that but they're not really titanic changes but this one feels like it could be you know this is a major get and it's a strange get because they've managed to pluck some of the biggest or the most like name recognizable video game companies around and some of the most major ip in the video game space you know that's arguable at the moment because (laughs) some of these franchises have been poorly treated this will come on to but there's a lot there i think that embracer group have taken on and it's interesting whether or not it's good for the developers i think it could be if they're just given license to get on with what they want to do you know square seem to have fairly real unrealistic expectations for a lot of these games and studios or at least quite unclear <laughs> and ambiguous thinking about what what they would have considered success to be and maybe embracer group will just let these teams make what they want and publish what they want and as long as they're making money that's fine but obviously then there's the flip side issue of that which is that maybe ultimately any wobble at the top in embracer any change in this stock market price could cost a lot of devs jobs because they're all held under one umbrella which you know again industry consolidation is something that we've been talking loads about and we'll talk more about uh, a little bit later so yeah quite a big meaty interesting story this one yeah it really is man i basically don't know what to make of it either in my heart obviously i hope that this is good for these studios because as you say they've not exactly had the best run under Square Enix, a lot of them, you would argue. Even IO Interactive, who used to be part of Square Enix, sort of got out, and I feel as though this might be their getting out as well, do you know what I mean? And they went on to make the Fantastic Hitman series, of course. You would like to hope for similar success for these studios, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, it all remains to be seen, but yeah, I think Embracer Group, we all sort of have to start taking them quite seriously now. When they own Tomb Raider, I think we all have to start <laughs> taking them quite seriously. Is that the and potentially the event? and potentially (laughs) Guardians of the Galaxy like we've got to take that publisher or whatever the hell they are seriously like we definitely do they are now a major player in the video game space as far as i'm concerned yeah and disney will be a kind of deciding factor in that i think if, if disney give them the thumbs up with whatever their weird structure is and they trust them to get on with making you know a sequel to guardians in particular that's a kind of mark of approval isn't it when a company like disney say yep we, we're happy to go ahead with this arrangement yeah definitely i mean i think that well i think that disney will decide how big a deal this is, do you know what I mean? It's a big (laughs) deal, but it could be a very big deal, you know? But on to Square Enix, listen, sort of news item number two, sort of part two of number one. Forget the structure, it doesn't matter. On to Square Enix, (laughs) listen. That's the first time you've ever said that. (laughs) No, 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 I like the structure normally, but in this particular situation, it doesn't work, so we're just moving on. (laughs) Firstly... Let's read a couple of paragraphs from Square Enix's press release regarding the acquisition. 
Yeah, so this section is headed purpose of the transaction. The transaction will assist the company in adapting to the changes underway in the global business environment by establishing a more efficient allocation of resources, which will enhance corporate value by accelerating growth in the company's core businesses in the digital entertainment domain. In addition, the transaction enables the launch of new businesses by moving forward with investments in fields including blockchain, AI and the cloud. The move is based on the policy of business structure optimization that the company set forth under the medium-term business strategy unveiled on May 13th, 2021. The transaction will also provide an opportunity to better align our overseas publishing function with our organization in Tokyo, revisit the current governance structure and associated reporting lines, and advance integrated group management with the goal of maximizing the worldwide revenue generated from future titles launched by the group's studios in Japan and abroad. Going forward, the company's development function will comprise its studios in Japan, Square Enix External Studios, and Square Enix Collective. The company's overseas studios will continue to publish franchises such as Just Cause, Outriders, and Life is Strange. So among all the waffle there was, (laughs) a few things should have jumped out at you, not least of which was that they are outright stating that this acquisition will allow them to invest more in blockchain. But let's circle back to that later, Lewis. Firstly... It very much seems as though Square will now be focusing mostly on their output from their Japanese studios, with the exception of the Life is Strange franchise, the Just Cause franchise, and the Outriders games as well, presuming that there will be more of them. And this also goes along with comments made by Square Enix's president, Yusuke Matsuda. He basically said in an interview with Yahoo Japan that while it is important to be selling games worldwide and to a worldwide audience, they shouldn't be making games specifically targeted to Western audiences, saying that it would be a mistake for their Japanese developers to try and imitate Western games. I'm not sure what that that says about for spoken loose which is a japanese developed game but is clearly clearly aimed at a western audience however maybe that's a discussion for another day <laughs> but i have to say on this point I think I agree with them. I think that Square are best when they are making their Japanese titles. Do you know what I mean? That's what made them famous in the first place. That's why they're in the position that they are. And Japan has such an incredible history with video games. It has an incredible culture around video games. And they have their own specific ways of doing things and things like that. I don't know why you would try and imitate Western games like that. Anyway, I have no idea why they were trying to do that in the first place. Obviously, you don't want to pigeonhole someone. And if they want to brand out and make different things in that way fair enough but really the japanese games that are their foundation should be their bread and bar Let, let's be honest here however circling back <laughs> to the blockchain stuff Lewis, and this is where i cease agreeing with mr matsuda because in the same interview with yahoo japan matsuda reiterated his enthusiasm for square enix to include nfts in their games he said that traditional games would be quotes not enough for square enix moving forward and described his vision for titles which involved user created content and that they would then be rewarded for that content I cannot help but draw parallels here between Square Enix and Ubisoft Lewis. Square have been chasing trends and chasing money in the way that Ubisoft have of late. They have watched a lot of their key IP failing over the last few years, or at least not living up to expectations. They seem to think that NFTs are going to solve all their problems. And they have now sold a significant portion of their business, which is something that we were just talking last week about Ubisoft potentially doing as well. And what they should actually be doing, Lewis, is concentrating on making good fucking games because they wouldn't be in this position if they were doing that. That's the main issue here. Yeah, I think that this side of the story is a really clear example of how the business practices behind games can affect the actual games that we play, right? Because as you were talking there, I was thinking, well, why shouldn't a Japanese company be able to make or imitate Western games, particularly when they are buying up European or American studios in order to do that, right? There's, You think it should work, but there's obviously a tension in the business operation side and the difference between Japanese development practices and business practices and then Western well, to be clear, European. like it's not that a Japanese studio can't do that. I mean, Sony have been doing it for years. Well, exactly, less. exactly. But they've obviously found the way to make the business part of it much smoother than it seems like, and you know, and Nintendo have done as well, much smoother than Square Enix have, right? Because what we've seen here is basically them strip out 
one whole chunk of their business to say that they're not capable of doing it essentially and moving off those studios and those IPs so they've got out of the space with this deal it seems like other than you know the one or two franchises that they mentioned they still have control over let's see what happens with those I mean Outriders doesn't feel like it's going to go anywhere <laughs> anyway just cause well. it's kind of on its arse a bit so I don't know one sort of thought I saw being floated around the internet on the in the wake of this is that this might still be a step similarly actually to what we were saying about Ubisoft last week a step in the direction of Square Enix the remaining part of Square Enix also being bought up because they are well, slimming down and they are getting rid of less profitable parts of their business well and that you can is kind a very interesting thoughtless there may be one or two or maybe even three big video game publishers who would be quite happy to have a really successful Japanese development team you know there's a, a clear connection to Sony obviously but Xbox talk a lot about wanting to break into the Japanese market, you know, there's a way to do that. I just hope that this isn't Square Enix becoming Konami, and they're shifting all their business away from making games, or making games as the centrepiece of their business, at least, and going towards all these crazy get-rich-quick schemes like stupid NFT nonsense, which it does feel like. I'm interested that this strategy that was mentioned in the bit I read there was unveiled on May 13th, 2021. Now, a year later, the whole blockchain and NFT stuff looks quite different I think to what it might have done at that point because it's been tried a bunch of times and failed miserably in the gaming space and maybe they'll come to regret following this strategy in time but I I really hope that they don't go down that Konami route of sort of weird isolation and focusing on a load of bullshit essentially. <laughs> I don't think pachinko machines are quite no, bullshit. No, fair enough. <laughs> well, not quite as much bullshit as NFTs, let's be honest. <laughs> All right, list news item number three. Both Xbox and PlayStation seem to be hiring quote unquote acquisition managers. Speaking of acquisitions, list. Last week, a job posting for Xbox said that they were looking for someone to, quotes, develop and evaluate the business cases for content technology acquisition, then in brackets, M&A, which is mergers and acquisitions. And the Sony one from this week basically said the same thing, but in a somehow even more wordy manner. This very strongly implies to me that they are both not done making acquisitions lists, and arguably hires like this is them looking to accelerate the process of making acquisitions. We have read rumours for weeks, obviously, that PlayStation are in the final stages of a major acquisition. We were hearing last week about Ubisoft potentially being sold, and we've spoken about that this week. Square Enix have obviously just sold off a major part of their business. We're now seeing the emergence of Embracer Group potentially as a big player in the space. There is always the threat of Microsoft buying someone. I think I just think that will be true for now until the end of Timeless. We have also seen the likes of Jason Schreier, Greg Miller, Jeff Grubb, Jeff Keighley, Imran Khan, and many, many more, all saying that they are constantly hearing rumbles about acquisitions in the industry. The video games industry mergers and acquisitions activity has already hit a record high of $85 billion in 2021, and it's only mailless. And Reuters have said that they have forecast for that number to reach $150 billion this year. So in terms of the money spent on acquisitions in the video game space, they are forecasting for us to only be slightly halfway done in terms of money spent. Lewis, what do you make of all this? Obviously, we've spoken a lot already about acquisitions. We've spoken before as well about consolidation in the video games industry and that being an issue. And I just think that that issue is becoming clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. And we might not even be halfway done, quite literally, you know? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty worrying trend that we find ourselves in, I think. In some ways, I'm surprised that both Microsoft and Sony didn't have this role in place already, given that they've been spent the last couple of years seemingly doing nothing but mergers and acquisitions so to to finally be putting people in charge to be clear yeah i think that this is like a directorial position you know yeah. i mean i think they've probably had teams doing well, this exactly since yeah, the dawn so, of their companies which, yeah. <laughs> which says then that it's being kind of elevated to the top table you know you need yeah, someone exactly, to kind of exactly, represent yeah. that so it's not surprising in the slightest it's and you know as i say it's surprising that it wasn't already there but both of these companies are going to keep expanding just now it's just the the nature of the business right now for whatever reason the the way that the market's gone the instability in the global economy means that companies want to sell up or, or make shareholders a quick buck or you know take advantage of the fluctuations that we're seeing i don't i don't know enough about it to say why this is happening at, at this pace just now but 
like you say, it feels like something that any given moment another thing is going to be announced. That the Embracer Group thing is a a really worrying big bit of mergers because there's so many studios there's so many jobs under one head in there and if as i was saying earlier if any of these big companies wobble it's the people right down at the bottom of those ladders that get affected by it so i don't love to see it but i think it's here to stay we're we're bound to whether or not it reaches quite those financial heights who knows but it's going to keep going at pace yeah it's crazy that we've already set a record in the video games industry and i know a lot of that is obviously the Activision acquisition, but the fact that it could nearly double by the end of the year is absolutely wild. Absolutely wild. And as you say, I think that Embracer Group now have 14,000 devs working for them. That includes the 1,100 that will be coming on board with uh, the Square Enix acquisition. And as you said, that is a lot, a lot, a lot of people, you know. And they don't really have the track record, I suppose, of someone like Microsoft, who I'm sure employ many, many, many more people than that. Or even Sony, do you know what I mean? Like, if they go tits up, would it really shock anyone? That's not going to happen to Microsoft, and that's not going to happen to Sony either, you know. So, yeah, that security for for devs and for jobs is, is, is a real concern, but it just feels as though i don't know reducing the space just means that there's only a few big players do you know what i mean like we'll never see those i mean we'll come on e3 in a little minute list but we'll never see those e3 shows where all the big publishers come yeah. down because there might only be three do you <laughs> yeah. know what i mean which is a bit sad you know yeah it definitely does feel like a big moment of change I, I, the industry as we viewed it even just a couple of years ago it is sort of gone and we are moving to a space where we're only left with a few major publishers hopefully that will you know in time lead to another burst of indie development because that tends to be what happens a bit when when things get a little too condensed but I, I think what we've talked about before and what would really worry me is that we end up with almost two games industries one that is completing at the absolute major blockbuster money level and then a sort of underclass of people just trying to find an audience because they've been squeezed out of the space by these bigger groups but we'll see I mean as I say we're going to be doing one of these a week for the rest of the year probably is <laughs> how it feels at the moment who's been bought this week yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> it does feel a bit like that just now, I've got to say. Anyway, let's news item number four. Xbox and Bethesda have announced that they are holding their annual showcase on June the 13th. This is nearly exactly a year to the day since their E3 showcase last year. See, I told you we'd go on E3. <laughs> which I think merely highlights just how useful E3 is to these big publishers now. E.g. not very. I mean, to be honest with you, if Xbox are having this big annual presentation at the same time that they would have done, whether E3 is happening or not, presumably bringing the same content, whether E3 is happening or not, what are E3 bringing to the table in that situation? I personally have no fucking idea, and I don't think people like Sony, who have already long walked away from this, have any idea either i don't really know why xbox decided to sort of cling on e3 for so long i I honestly think that might have been a pr thing just to be like we're still here we're still doing the big thing use like which is totally fine like i'm not saying that like it was a pro-consumer move in an era when they were making a lot of pro-consumer moves so it makes sense but in reality i mean what is the fucking point in e3 at this point you know but anyway let we'll come back to what all this means for e3 in a little second To the presentation itself, I guess we all sort of know what the Xbox and Bethesda studios are working on right now. To give a very quick rundown of the sort of major ones, we've got Ninja Theory's Hellblade 2, we've got Obsidian's Outer World 2 and Avowed, we've got Rare's Everwild, although whether or not that's actually going to see the light of day is still a bit touch and go. We've got the Initiative's Perfect Dark, although that's also seen trouble as well. Then we've got Arcane's Redfall, Undead Labs State of Decay 3, Turn 10's Forza Motorsport 8, and of course the big one, Lewis, Bethesda's Starfield. I suppose the questions to you, Lewis, are what do you think is the impact of this on E3, if any, to be honest? And what are you expecting from this showcase? Well, just to start with E3, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, at the moment, E3 is dead. And so, I mean, its impact is sort of a bit late, really, because (laughs) Xbox had kind of semi... They were sort of semi-separate from E3 over the last few years anyway. It was all at the same time. It was kind of on the same campus, so to speak, but not quite part of the official thing. Or, like, they had a sort of funny external relationship to it in a way that Sony just entirely pulled out. But I think that what we've seen and what we've talked about at length in the past is that these companies, they they don't need any of that. And I think you're bang on that Microsoft staying involved with E3 was a way of 
yeah kind of saying to the audience we're still here we're still part of this and we'll be there but also probably because the costs associated for microsoft were probably small change really to them and so why not kind of be part of the official press pack and, and kind of be there when everyone else is particularly when e3 could bring a ton of gamers and journalists to the space but microsoft can just do whatever they want now and i think putting it in the same space i mean we might as well ask the question really what does this mean for summer games fest because (laughs) it is picking up the mantle like will this event be kind of put under that umbrella i suspect it will or keely will kind of take it under his umbrella (laughs) even if microsoft don't ask but (laughs) i think that's that's where we're at e3 is finished these companies can do it without them and unless e3 or the esa can kind of give a business reason for them still to be involved they just look like a middleman and i'm not sure what they're doing in terms of the xbox side of things and what they'll show i think you know as you say there's a a list of fairly obvious games we'll see there i'm hoping that we might sort of see the next phase of bethesda so we might sort of see wolfenstein which would be a big one for us i think um yeah that'd be awesome indication of what's coming from that looking forward to seeing the indiana jones game as well you know hopefully we'll get a bit of footage of that i wouldn't be stunned to get a bit of a or i would hope at least to get a bit of a i don't want to use the word reboot but some kind of refresh of halo to kind of get people invigorated with that again because there's been a lot of talk of how that's been struggling oh Halo's going to be shown i don't know in what capacity but it will be shown i think their new season will just have kind of started around then so i guess it will be built around that but hopefully they'll come out with some big announcement about like the next phase or whatever it might be because i think they need to get some goodwill back on that game and i guess finally and maybe a slightly more of a question to you but do you think any acquisitions will be announced on stage at an event like that wow that would be fucking insane <laughs> if that happened honestly no i don't really think it's the place for that to be honest i i really don't people want to make their own press releases to shareholders and all that and blah 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 blah, blah. i'm not really sure that that's even really possible to do that but i don't know maybe maybe it's fucking xbox they very well might they might have bought three people already that we don't even know about they might have just bought nintendo or something crazy <laughs> don't say that <laughs> although we, we don't say we, we don't say bad things like that sorry Liz. no the the real ones that i want to see were one that you just mentioned which is machine games anything that machine games are working on hopefully that's wolfenstein 3 and Ed. hopefully they are working on oh, yeah, course, another yeah. doom game that would be absolutely awesome to see 100 percent. in terms of what this means for e3 yeah i think that this sort of doesn't really mean anything for e3 because e3 sort of don't matter anymore and unfortunately it's, it sounds very very harsh to say that but it is sort of the situation that they're in whether or not Jeff Keighley is going to commandeer this as part of Summer Games Fest will be quite interesting. But I think Summer Games Fest is sort of doing a different thing. It's doing what E3 should be doing. It's a lot of like sort of smaller things all together from lots of different people all over the place. It's not like one big huge showcase from one big huge publisher all at the one time. You know, it's just wee bits and pieces from lots of different people. And I think that's sort of the way you have to go if you're going to do something like this, you know. But yeah. I think E3, as we know at least, is, is long gone, sadly. But yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing what Xbox have to show here because they have a lot of exciting stuff in the pipeline, frankly. All right, let's finish off as we always do with a couple of shout outs. Shout out number one. It's the first podcast of the month, and that means free games loose. On PS Plus, you have FIFA 22, Tribes of Midgar, and Curse of the Dead Gods. Kind of mad to see FIFA 22 there, which is sort of doing a lot of the heavy lifting for this month, I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think those other two are meant to be all right, but yeah, FIFA 22 appearing is quite a big get for them. I think there's rumours that It feels that's... quite early for that. I know that FIFA games have come before a PS yeah. Plus, but this one feels early. It does to me as well. I, I guess it's the tail end of the season, but it, and maybe they're just trying to get that extra kind of interest and those extra ultimate team bucks through the summer but there's a lot of rumblings just now that this it's going to go on a game pass as well not even as part of the ea play part but just naturally on a game pass so they're obviously trying to get more bums on seats so to speak in in fifa yeah definitely all about them microtransactions yeah and on games pass this month you have loot river which is actually available now and then on may the 5th you have citizen sleeper and trek to yomi trek to yomi i believe is launching on games pass then on may the 10th you have danganronpa goodbye despair anniversary edition euden chronicles rising and this war of mine final cut then on the 12th you have nhl 22 through ea play then on the 24th you have floppy nights and hard space shipbreaker then on the 26th you have sniper elite 5 and finally on the 27th you have pac-man museum plus and leaving games pass on the 10th is grand theft auto san andreas the definitive edition and leaving on may the 15th is enter the gungeon final fantasy 10 slash 10 2 hd remaster remnant from the ashes steep the catch carp and course and the wild at heart 
Trek to Yomi, by far the standout there, Lewis. It's a very interesting game, and to come out swinging on Games Pass, I think it might be a good move for it. Yeah, I totally agree. It's an exciting one to get access to. It's out on all other platforms, pretty much. You're going to be paying basically full price for that. So, yeah, if you've got access to Game Pass, there you go. Another another good reason to be a subscriber to this. It comes out the day that this podcast does, which is also the same day that it launches onto Game Pass. But there's no reviews at the moment, which is a little worrying to me. But hopefully that's just because it's a small game. Yeah, hopefully we get some reviews in soon. And hopefully those reviews are good because it does look visually stunning, I've got to say. As I said, Ghost of Tsushima meets Sifu. And I think that'll probably appeal to a lot of people you know <laughs> yeah, definitely all right let's shout out number two nintendo switch sports has come out this week this is the successor to the immensely popular wii sports it's currently sitting with a 74 on metacritic which might sound a little bit underwhelming but i don't actually think that that is a true indication of how much people are enjoying this game because it does seem as though people are enjoying this game obviously this is basically a party game let's be honest you're probably not going to have the time of your life playing this by yourself but you get a few friends around, you plug it in, you all start jumping about like mad people, you know what I mean? You'll be having a great laugh in no time. And I think that Nintendo have basically cornered the market on party games, or maybe they've just been allowed to corner the market because none of the other platform holders make stuff like this. But I'm glad that they do make things like this because it's sort of fun and a game that you can play together in person, you know what I mean? And I'm just sort of glad that games like that exist. However, it does have to be said that within 24 hours of the game releasing, a Twitch streamer already broke his TV by accidentally throwing a Joy-Con oh, no. at it. So that does have to be <laughs> taken notice of. Make sure you get a good grip on those Joy-Cons, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, dig out those <laughs> wrist straps that it came with that everyone immediately just put away. <laughs> Discarded immediately, yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> All right, let's shout out number three. Rogue Legacy 2 has also come out this week and it is reviewed very well, I've got to say. It's currently sitting with an 88 on Series X and a 91 on PC. If you don't know by its name, Rogue Legacy 2 is a roguelike game, but the original Rogue Legacy was apparently one of the first games to really popularise the roguelite genre, e.g. you don't quite start from scratch again, you, you earn a wee bit of XP or something that makes the next run that little bit easier, you know? So it's all their fault, Lewis. It's all their fault. That's where it started. <laughs> This game does seem to be very much in line with Rogue Legacy as well. It's just a sort of modernised version of it, an updated version of it for 2022. I think the first game came out like nine years ago, so the industry has moved on significantly. I've got to say, I think that in terms of its art style and stuff like that, I think it looks really, really good, really, really sharp looking. But, of course, it's a roguelike, therefore it is not for me. But, Lewis, what are your thoughts? I mean, kind of the same, to be honest. It's not one of the ones that really excites me in the sort of roguelike space, but it does seem to have a really big following, which I hadn't really realised until the last few days. mad for this, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it might be worth checking out, but there's only so many roguelikes you can go through in a row and not get sick of them. So if you've been playing anything else in that vein recently, maybe just give yourself a wee break before taking this on. Although, you know, some people just absolutely love this genre. It's just you've definitely got a, a bit of a thing about it and I'm not mad into it all the time either. <laughs> no it's definitely one of the genres which I do not like in video games but if you do like them this might be one to look into because a lot of people do seem to genuinely be loving it all right shout out number four infinity ward have officially confirmed that the next call of duty game will be call of duty modern warfare 2 this will be a sequel to 2019's modern warfare which was a reboot of the branch of call of duty that is modern warfare however I think that we've basically known about this for a very long time Lewis I think Activision themselves have even previously confirmed that it was just officially confirmed or officially announced uh, by Infinity Ward this week. Apparently the campaign will be centred around a drug war against a Colombian cartel and it will be grittier, quote unquote, than Modern Warfare 2019's campaign with more close quarters combat, tricky decision making and the classic Call of Duty set piece moments. But obviously this game will live and die off the success of its multiplayer and reality, which really depends on how much Activision want to put into it and how much they want to try and nickel and dime you with microtransactions lists. This game comes off the back of Call of Duty Vanguard, which by their own admission and by their own standards did not sell particularly well for them. In fact, I think it underperformed by their metrics. But with the Modern Warfare name in tow, I strongly suspect that this will be a roaring success, Lewis, particularly commercially, of course. 
Yep, another year, another Call of Duty. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm a little baffled by this reboot series now because it seemed like they were... Didn't the, the last one retell the story of the original Call of Duty Modern Warfare? Not so much. It was a sort of reimagining or whatever. Yeah, you know, but it, it had like crossover sort of loosely characters connected, and stuff. Loosely connected. Yeah. So yeah, so to be clear, I think that this is the same. I think there was like crossover characters and stuff like that, but it's not... I think to call it a remake or, a, or even a retelling of that original story would be a bit false. Yeah, well, know? it sounds like it's, you know, happening in a different continent even, so... Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm a little wary of all that because it does feel like using the name of probably, if I'm not mistaken, like one of the most popular games in that franchise and just sort of sure. going, yep, it's this, buy it again, and then it turns out it's not that. But, you know, Call of Duty fans will Call of Duty and there's nothing that I'm going to say that will stop them from doing that, so... <laughs> nope, will almost certainly be the highest selling game of this year list yep. <laughs> all right and final shout out number five xbox have apparently been in scotland for 20 and presumably the uk but have been in scotland for 20 years and to celebrate they have made their own tartan which they have then used to like cover a controller so it looks like a tartan controller which i think is fucking awesome Lewis. This is obviously a ultra rare exclusive thing that they're giving away as like part of a Twitter giveaway. Do you know what I mean? They used Gordon Nicholson kilt makers in Edinburgh to make the tartan. The tartan was made by hand apparently and was then put onto the contro- all the controllers by hand. They, they're also one of the most well known names in kilts in Scotland for those that don't know. <laughs> and I just thought it was fucking cool. It was it was a fucking cool thing. And we're Scottish, so it felt as though we were sort of obligated to talk about it. And also. I want one so yeah <laughs> <laughs> I wondered when that part was going to come up yeah uh, yeah it's an odd thing that they're doing this yeah given as you say they've been in the UK as just as long as they've been in Scotland but you know maybe we'll, maybe we'll get national dress versions from the other three nations at some point but <laughs> just fun to see yeah Xbox acknowledge it I think there was a can of Iron Brew in the, in the sort of advert thing they put out for this as well yeah there just, was yeah. just like you know oh, they've noticed us they know who we are <laughs> yeah that, I thought that was nice as well I can't wait to see the Morris dance in English one that'll be lovely <laughs> <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, and with that, it's time for a beer, then we'll be back for Topic of the Week. And we are back for Topic of the Week. Topic of the Week this week is our play along of the Artful Escape list. It is indeed, Mark. Yeah, so all this month we've been playing through The Artful Escape, which is, for anyone, I guess, who wasn't playing along with us, it's a fascinating little game, I think, and we'll obviously dive into the discussion in a minute, developed by debut studio Beethoven and Dinosaur, which the whole story behind them is quite interesting in itself. Like, the the studio was formed by this musician called Johnny Galvatron, who's the guitarist for a band called the Galvatrons, who I didn't know. I think, basically, he knew a bit about music and animation and coding, and while bored on tour, started kind of noodling together some little game concepts eventually founded a studio alongside a couple of other musicians and a couple of proper IT people who <laughs> knew how to press the buttons and make a game and that is where this has all come from which is just like a pretty unconventional background to this game which in itself is like a fairly unconventional piece I think in, in certain ways. Published by Annapurna which definitely is not <laughs> unconventional for them it is so in the Annapurna wheelhouse it is Oh this could unreal. not be more of an Annapurna game. <laughs> yeah. Like when the, it's quite early on in the game that you get the bump of their, their name across the bottom of the screen and you're just like oh yeah of course like I can tell just from the art style that that's <laughs> where we're at here so yeah and this is basically it's a short game it's a pretty simple straightforward game in in some senses the story of francis vendetti a young musician and i think what's meant to be the 90s living in the shadow of his much more famous uncle who is essentially this world's bob dylan i guess like that's the yes very transparently this world's bob dylan this is the the (laughs) parallel that's being drawn and he is trying to have his debut performance at a a sort of an event marking 20 years since the release of his uncle's most prominent or debut album and he has a bit of a crisis of confidence a crisis in self-belief and in self-worth and isn't really sure what kind of musician he wants to be and how he should be and all that kind of stuff and ends up well either going on an intergalactic adventure or having serious brain trauma because what happens from that moment on is quite bizarre and goes off in some right really unexpected directions for my money what are your headline thoughts on the game mark did you enjoy it did i enjoy what i will say okay this is going to sound like a negative right away i i didn't enjoy this game as much as i wanted to is probably what i'm trying Mm -hmm. to say here really however that does not mean that this is actually i think it's quite a good game it's a sort of it's sort of unbelievable that this game exists in a lot of ways, I think. It weirdly sort of reminds me of 
Kentucky Route Zero in a lot of ways, <laughs> and that there isn't a hell of a lot to do in the game, which we'll, I'm sure we'll come on to yeah. in a minute. Basically, it is a game that sort of happens to you rather than you happen to it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that that's a fair comment, absolutely. I'm, I'm definitely going to wheel us on to a discussion on gameplay in a little bit because I think that that's absolutely one of the core things about it and there's no escaping that it's not much of a game in the traditional sense. But I wanted to jump in on the kind of art style and music because that's obviously what the core of this game is. It is about music, it is laced throughout with music, it uses music in, as its gameplay, in its gameplay, and it also the thing that caught me off guard really because you see in stills from the game and in short clips that it's a very nice looking game but actually when just in that first kind of 20 minutes of playing it as you journey through the town I was kind of taken by how visually impressive I thought it was like it's got an art style it's not super realistic or anything like that but I just thought the environments all the way through and the, the worlds that he finds himself in but even the basic earth <laughs> that he starts on this kind of forest uh, and big wheat field and a mountain that you kind of run through I just I thought it was a really visually gorgeous game where I wanted a bit more differentiation was in the music, ironically, given that this is the story of a boy who doesn't really want to be a folk musician and sort of goes off to become this prog rock space opera figure. And very, you know, it's very much the David Bowie trajectory as well. You can see that that's a big influence on the whole thing has been the Bowie's style and, and all that. I just I thought it was a bit of a misstep that they didn't do more musical styles. I kind of expected that throughout the game he would be experimenting with all different types of music to find his kind of st- his own style and his own sense. And instead, and particularly given that the game's set in the nineties, like they could have at least done a sort of grungy thing. But instead, he just basically wanted to be this one other type of person, and you went through a process of playing some of that music across space, <laughs> and then the game kind of ends. Yeah, I mean you're not wrong there. I've got to say a lot of the music was giving me mad Pink Floyd vibes yep, absolutely. at points as well I've got to course, say of course. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean you know you're not wrong and I would actually agree with that so most of the game you can hold I was playing on Xbox so it was the X button on Xbox and it will just play guitar licks endlessly do you know what I mean but they um, sort of become a bit samey after a while and I'm not actually sure if they do change between planet to planet they were so similar between planet yep. to planet that I couldn't even really couldn't tell sure, yeah. if they did change if they changed very much at all yeah I thought it would have been nicer if actually the whole concept was that it wasn't necessarily that he wanted to be this person already and he knew this from the start and it was just about him finding the self-confidence and to be who he wants to be do you know what I mean which, which is a, a fair enough storyline and theme for the game like no disrespect to that I just think it would have been potentially better if he was creeping out from his enormously successful uncle shadow and he'd only played folk music his whole life like he'd only been the bob dylan kid his entire life and suddenly he's discovering these types of music he's discovering prog rock and grunge and and pop and whatever yeah. you know what i mean like that i think that that actually may have been a more compelling story and would have allowed them to do more musically which is really interesting that you said that this was made essentially by a bunch of musicians because I, I didn't know that mm-hmm. and i thought that they would have wanted to have done that like yeah. they would have been like yeah let me play a thousand different things this game rather than play this one thing <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean that leads us really nicely onto the story side because the music and the story are so intertwined i thought it was you know quite a fun story quite unpredictable in some senses because like they lurch into space travel and interdimensional zones and all that stuff and you know enormous yeah, that monsters. bit was done that was done the poorest see where it went from he's in his bedroom to now he's in space that was yeah. quite jarring however either side of that was fantastic yeah i, I, re- I really did genuinely like it i thought it it was yeah it was clever and it was inventive in that way i I definitely one of the key points of criticism really that i had of the game is that it felt really rushed in places like you say that transition there i also thought that the end sequences it was sort of like he at one point is told that he won't be able to confront essentially the final boss because he's still got some doubt in him and then he like wakes up or has a dream about being back at home and deciding not to play the folk stuff and then he's suddenly just told yep okay you can go forward and fight the final boss now it just it happens within seconds that what should have felt like a, a major epiphany i think all the way through the game it feels like they were trying to cram what should have been a much longer game into a smaller space because they just didn't have the tools or the budget to do it 
True. And and to be honest with you, that is a completely valid criticism, and I do agree with you there. I think that there were a lot of points where it felt rushed and it felt as though he'd not done a lot, and then suddenly he was like the greatest musician in the yeah. galaxy sort of thing, like five minutes later. Absolutely. And I was like, what? Like, that it just all sort of happened very, very quickly. But to be honest with you, see, because it's an indie game, see, because they are working probably on a very tight budget and they are trying to do something quite ambitious with this game in reality, I can sort of forgive that in a lot of ways. I, I really can. I, I didn't mind that so much at all. They were trying to cram a lot into a short space of time, though. I will definitely give you that. <laughs> yeah. But that to me, again, it's not a major criticism from me either, because like you say, they, they've got limitations and that's fine. I just wonder whether somewhere in all of this, there's a much bigger kind of musical RPG that could be really excellent, which could explore all these different avenues and would, you know, things like the dialogue choices, and I'm, I'm slightly moving on to gameplay discussion here already, but the dialogue choices, which are just flavor, really, they don't have any impact generally speaking on anything that's going on and it, it would have been nice had they had a bit more impact in the development so that everyone's francis could have ended up slightly different from one another and also things like the plot line with violetta and lightman i just felt like they were setting up some interesting questions around them and certainly violetta's character i thought was you know you could make a sequel game about her really but it just it just kind of wrapped up and then that was done and then the game was done and i just yeah it felt like yeah, I don't know. It's just that it needed space to expand, but it would have really overstayed its welcome had it been any longer because gameplay wise, oh, I thought this was pretty slight overall in a way that I'd found way less enjoyable than other games that are a bit like this. Oh, wow, that's interesting. I'm sort of surprised to hear you say that because it arguably has more gameplay than Kentucky Route Zero, which yeah. I'm going to compare it to again, which you seem to absolutely adore. So what about this, I suppose, I'm going to ask you, was the issue? Because I, like, I knew going in that there was, I mean, it was very basic platforming, let's be honest, and then it was memorising musical notes and playing your guitar sort of thing. Like yeah. That that was it. And by memorising musical notes, I mean, oh, press X now, press square now, press triangle, then back to square, then R1, then you get another sequence, then you do that. And then like, it's, it's very, yeah. very straightforward. There's no real challenge in the game whatsoever, no. but nor... Was I expecting that, I suppose? No, I, I agree with that. And that is all the game is. I just see the first hour where those things were being introduced. I really liked them. I liked the guitar mini game. I even liked, you know, holding X to shred as you moved about that kind of awoke things in the environment around you. And, you know, just the nice little flourishes like yeah, that. that was but cool. Yeah, I yeah, just yeah, felt definitely. like it had given us everything that it had gameplay wise in that first hour. And it never built anything on top of that. Even the, the boss sequences were always, you know, patterns of things three stages of you know matching the button inputs essentially and then it would just move on to the next thing and i really wish that it had expanded out on that i, th I can't really understand why they didn't have some kind of freeform mode on the guitar playing mini game as well so that you could kind of jam and experiment yourself thinking back to like the guitar stuff in the last of us part two which obviously i accept as a, <laughs> as a bigger budget and stuff than this does but you know i just thought there was more gameplay wise that could have been done there to me the difference between this and something like kentucky route zero and i, I would throw loads of games into this same basic bracket things like oxen free and that as well where you're kind of just moving around having bare bones interactions and picking dialogue choices kentucky route zero didn't try to be gamey the addition of the platform and stuff and this is doesn't really add very much it is, this could have been on rails basically for most of it and it wouldn't have yeah changed, sure it's basically make holding the stick to the right slightly more interesting yeah but then I also mean. you know what happened for me was that i was ending up holding holding the stick and holding square to play or x to play the riffs and then having to kind of flick my thumb down to hit the jump button every so often it was just like unnecessary very minor criticism again but the, really the difference there as well is that kentucky route zero story wise and it's its whole structure it's kind of five part play structure all of that was just far far more interesting than what this game did which was pretty conventional like again story wise i do feel like there's a bit of a an under thread of indie games which basically amount to be yourself and don't worry about it if people make fun of you and it just that kind of message just keeps happening again and again and so i didn't feel like it developed much story wise there and then gameplay wise it because i even texted you really early and said i'm quite impressed so far and i remain so with the visuals and the music but at that first wee bit of the game i thought oh, this is going to be quite a fun game to play like i'm running about i'm having these discussions i'm doing the guitar mini game and then it was just sort of that in a different guise like three or four times until the end of the game again i think there's a world where this has like a much bigger 
branching dialogue tree system and you play different riffs to do different things and it could i think that the integration of music into an otherwise like essentially like walking sim game is really cool and could be could be a really interesting like input mechanic essentially for games going forward but it just needed more for me i guess on that like this game has won awards it's been nominated for a bunch of awards and if it was on a lot of people's like best games of last year lists do you think it deserves that where I, I sound like i'm being really down on it just now i did enjoy it but I, I have my concerns about that yeah i have to admit i thought that i was going to come on here and i would be the one that was sounding down on it like i enjoyed the game but yeah. i mean all your criticisms here are like completely valid right while the story is like quite a nice story but yeah i mean you're not wrong i mean it's been done a thousand times in, in reality i thought that the nice bit when you got to like choose your wardrobe for the yeah first time, that was really like, like and all bit, that yeah. like i thought that was that was a really nice moment there was actually a lot about that moment that was just like quite good altogether but like those moments were not enough like there should have been more moments and it felt as though that was the first time that you were like choosing yeah who you were do you know what i mean and you got to choose your name like quite early on and how the galaxy should refer to you and stuff like that and to like differentiate yourself from this folk boy with the famous uncle sort of thing and i liked all that but as well like a lot of the decision making was just as you said totally irrelevant like completely irrelevant and i just think that don't put in dialogue options if the dialogue options don't fucking matter it really annoys me that because i thought that there might be like multiple endings to this game or something like that but there's there's as far as i'm aware anyway no. like there no. is not like it felt very succinctly wrapped up yeah. in do you know what i mean for multiple dialogue options so there was actually only a few of those dialogue options that actually mattered throughout the entire thing and yeah like even if you just kept it to them like just keep it to the ones that matter and then that's fine do you know what i mean but don't give me a whole bunch of dialogue options and none of them matter so that was actually a criticism that i was coming in with as well but yeah did it deserve all the accolades that it got i mean sort of yeah because a lot of those awards are just voted for by pundits or um people in the industry space and if they liked it they fucking liked it and i mean and i mean fair enough to them like I think that there have been a lot more, even sort of like interesting walking sims, which this sort of is, to be honest with you. Like, what it means to be the Finch immediately jumps to mind is like mm -hmm. a more interesting walking sim. Do you yeah. know what I mean? That's doing something also in the magical realism sort of space that is just miles, miles apart in my mind. Do you know what I mean? From what this is trying to do, which in, in reality is a very simple game with a, a relatively uncomplex story. And there's nothing really wrong with that. But as you said, the gameplay is also quite uncomplex as well and by the end of it do you know what they did tell a pretty good story their art style is absolutely fucking gorgeous their music is absolutely fucking gorgeous as well they did a pretty good job but was it like indie game of the year i mean for me no not really yeah. it wasn't in that plateau to be yeah, honest i would concur with that exactly i do realize that it sounded a bit harsh and i really did enjoy it like when the four hours or whatever were up i was like yep that was fine enjoyed that musically and, and visually especially but i'm not sad that i played it I'm yeah exactly I, and it I think as you started actually when you said you kind of expected to like it more or you hoped that you would like it more that's basically where i'm at with that first hour particularly i thought this could be really cool and by the end i was like yep yeah, all right glad i played it but that's plenty you know but you know absolutely fair play to them and, and especially well done on the kind of visual and audio side i think it's a, a triumph there yeah definitely great game it doesn't overstate its welcome it's only four hours it's on games pass it's definitely worth checking out like seriously i, I would recommend that you play it but it's just not it didn't realize its ambitions i don't think and i, I think that there is uh absolutely knockout game in here as you said but i don't think that they maybe had the budget or yeah. the experience to, to accomplish that <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, I think we'll have to call it a day there. I'd like to remind everyone that you can find Players 2 on all the social media. That is Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, the lot. You can also find our written content over at players2.com. That's P-L-A-Y-E-R-S-T-O-O.com. And if you could take five seconds to give us five stars over on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts, that really, really, really helps us out. It does a huge amount for the exposure of the show. And while you're over there, if you could leave us a little review as well, again, that just helps us out even more. And seriously, thank you so much to anyone that's already done that for us. You're an absolute legend to us. All right, Lewis, and we will have to announce our new play-along game for this month. And the play-along game for this month is two play-along games, Lewis, for the first <laughs> time ever. It is The Black Iris and Welcome to Elk. Both of these games were part of the itch.io Ukraine bundle, which we said we would add into our play-along games. And here we've done that. And I think this is a good thing to do. But Lewis, 
We're playing two games this month. <laughs> <laughs> we are indeed, yeah. We're, we're going to be playing The Black Iris, which is only about 30 to 40 minutes long, according to how long to beat. Um, this is by a, a Scottish developer based in Western Buttonshire, which is not far from us at all. It's set in northeast Scotland. It's a, a little cosmic horror game. I've been really interested in it for a while. I've actually already had paid for it before, but it was in this bundle, so it made sense to do it. And then we're also playing Welcome to Elk, which it looks like a fascinating little game that neither of us knew very well before, but it's all based on true stories and I think sort of traditional storytelling forms but done in this really interesting like animated style reminiscent of some of the cartoons actually that we've sort of watched and liked over the years yeah incredible art style really, yeah really, really striking interesting look. and that's only about three to four hours long according to how long to beat so the two together wouldn't take even as long or, or about the same amount of time as something like the Artful Escape did so we just thought we would double up and kind of dive into this itch.io bundle at long last and kind of see what comes out of it I'm, re- I'm really excited for this one I've been looking forward to the Black Iris in particular for ages yeah man this is going to be cool this is going to be a totally different thing than what we've done before we have played a lot of indie games now but in reality these indie games are top of the range indie games yeah. this is itch.io single developer stuff so I'm really really interested to dive into this space as well I don't think either of us have done it enough or as much as we should have done really to be honest so it's really great to to jump into some of these like properly small indie games and like see what's happening down there because this is where a lot of the creativity comes from do you know i mean this is where a lot of people are doing a lot of really interesting things all right ladies and gentlemen with that we will see you next week thanks